All right. Today is Tuesday, November 2nd. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. We're starting a little late. I hope you got the message for me, but we got a lot of crazy stuff here. Crazy moves, wild moves in the stock market, up and down, massacres going on right now as we speak. We have interesting developments here in the political arena, the elections in Virginia and New Jersey, which will have implications about the upcoming bill the so-called bill that they told us they're gonna have a vote today we don't have a vote so far it's gonna have a lot of implications on the fed chairman jerome powell we'll talk in the conclusion of this video but let's start with in focus tonight let's talk about the insane price action in many stocks but chiefly avis the ticker car we're also going to talk about earnings of course massive moves from the earnings that we got today and lastly the confirmation of the fake news the tesla hertz fake news we start with the story of avis a almost bankrupt rental car company yet the stock exploded higher today and gained bottom to top over two hundred percent in a single day so what happened here i'd say let's back up a few days ago i was watching cnbc i wasn't actually watching cnbc it was playing in the background but I heard their chart master, the chart guy, and he was talking about Avis and the upcoming earnings. And he was saying that the stock, from a technical perspective at least, is overextended and it is due for a pullback all the way to the whatever moving average. And the other guys on the panel also agreed with him that Avis is trading out of whack and it's going to pull back it's going to crash, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I then looked at the options grid and they were buying put options like crazy. Everybody was assuming that the stock will crash after earnings because it's already trading out of whack. So the risk was to the downside heading into earnings. However, I remember thinking, wait a minute here. We have a stock that's everybody, the consensus at least, says the stock is going to crash after earnings because it already moved higher. And it is due for a pullback, etc. But I remember thinking, this is setting up to be an accident waiting to happen because if everybody shorts heading into earnings before knowing the results, this could produce an accident, which in turn will result in a massive short squeeze. Because if you remember from the CPI, the PPI, all the inflation reports that we got before, rental car prices were exploding higher. So the assumption is Avis margins will also expand significantly higher. The argument from market participants, at least, that this is already accounted for. I did not short. I did not go along. I did not do anything at all. But I remember the thought in my head when I heard the segment on CNBC. Take a look. Car rental company Avis hitting the skids today, but the stock is still up a whopping 360% over the last year. If you've been lucky enough to ride the stock all the way up, the chart master says now might be the time to hop off because the stock is headed for a breakdown. Let's get to Carter Worth of Worth Charting. Carter, what are you seeing? Well, I'm seeing the word that you just used, whopping. I mean, it's been a whopper. But the question is, as is the case so often when stocks or currencies, commodities get ahead of themselves, at some point, it's just too much of a good thing. We saw it in lumber. We saw it in Moderna. Now, can they go higher day to day after one decides to sell or tries to sell short? Sure. But they always end the same way. Excess gets expunged. Uh, let's look at three charts. Uh, the first is three-year chart with the 150-day moving average. And what we know is the stock has effectively doubled in the past eight weeks, 90 to 180. It is trading higher above its 150 moving average at any time in its history. Take a look at the next chart. This is a five-year chart, but you start to get the same uh, feel, but even more excess. And then a third and final chart. This is a 30-year chart. And what we know is it's been exceptional. Yes, there are probably stories of you know, a bubble in used cars or shortages in this and blockchain, and it just goes on and on. And, and global problems with ports, but at some point, and, and, and this is the issue, your, your price for perfection. Interestingly, it has eight analysts covering on the street, uh, and collectively they think it's worth somewhere between 125 or 92 in the next 12 months, but the stock's trading at 180 as of yesterday. So at a minimum, I think you trim. Take some profits, do something. Carter, thank you. And again, this is a market technician. He is not an expert in market mechanics or fundamentals. 
and therefore he was presenting the argument from a technical perspective alone. But you always have to keep in mind, what happens if everybody assumes that the stock will move up or down, and they're wrong? We have seen these moves before. Last week, we don't have to go back in memory, just last week when market participants front-loaded earnings for big tech, these stocks crashed after earnings. When they go bananas, buying call options ahead of earnings, assuming the stock will explode higher, what happens if earnings disappoint? We see massive moves to the downside. On the other hand, when we have extreme bearishness and excessive shorting and buying of puts, what if earnings come out exceeding expectations? We see massive moves to the upside, as all of these shorts have to cover all of a sudden. And this is exactly what happened with Avis. The headline reads, Renal car company Avis reports earnings of 10.74 a share. Wall Street was looking for 7.24, so they were already looking for a decent number. The numbers came out exceeding expectations, and now all of a sudden all of these shorts have to scramble and cover the short positions by buying the stock. Now, don't get me wrong, by the way, this is a garbage stock, it's a garbage company, the valuation is out of whack, but when you are renting a Nissan Sentra for 400 bucks a day, your margins are going to explode significantly higher. This is exactly what was going on during the summer with the shortage of rental cars and of course everybody's saying that this is due to wall street bets and yoloing of the stock yada 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 it is not really the stock exploded higher due to short covering they front loaded the action at a time by shorting the stock and now they got caught with their pants down needless to say the action in car also known as avis excited the retail crowd to jump ahead and start yoloing meme stocks and by the way, somebody knew what's about to happen with Avis, and they bought call options ahead of time. Just something to keep in mind. But after the bell, we're seeing more wild action. For example, Bed Bath & Beyond, you know, the thriving company of Bed Bath & Beyond. The stock is exploding higher after the bell. At the highs of the session, the stock was trading up over 90%. Why? The company announced buyback plans. They also announced a collaboration with Kroger. Big deal, right? It doesn't matter. We're back at the YOLO mentality. We're seeing the options gambling mania making a comeback. And now we're seeing a lot of bets on meme stocks to explode higher. This is one of them, and it is exploding higher after hours. Somebody, of course, knew the action ahead of time, and they started buying calls. When you look at the options grid, the unusual activities, they were buying significant amount of call options on Bed Bath & Beyond with the expiration date of this upcoming Friday, meaning they knew ahead of time about the news and they bought call options. I mean, I really believe that these people did not know about the news ahead of time. Come on, man. And then we have AMC also exploding higher after hours, along with GME, GameStop, all of the meme stocks are exploding higher after hours. The action in Avis excited the meme stock mania. When we look at the options grid for GME and AMC, all I have to say is, come on, man. Come on, man. They knew. They knew ahead of time. And they started buying a significant amount of call options with the expiration date of, you guessed it, this upcoming Friday. But not every stock was exploding higher, by the way. The wild moves were to the upside and the downside. Take, for example, the ticker CHGG, Sheg. The stock got slaughtered, an absolute massacre, a crash of over 49% today alone. When we look at the chart, the writing was on the wall. We had the head and shoulder formation, but this is a sizable move to the downside. Massive amount of selling here. So what happened with Sheg? Here's what happened. The company lost nearly half of its value after providing an earnings outlook that raised concerns about the health of its business and online education in general. Sheg's stock collapses as more students give up school and head to work. And I say, you know what? They're not heading to work. Maybe some of them. But the majority of them are skipping college altogether and they're just staying at home. We have a lost generation right now. They're skipping college, they're skipping school, and the excuse is the pandemic, of course. Either these kids are going to go to work right away, skipping college, or they're going to be a lost generation. And this will have an enormous socioeconomic ramifications. Watch out here. And this is, of course, supported by this story. We have a Subway franchisee. She pulled her teen son out of school 
to work at the store because we have a labor shortage. The lady says, I cannot find workers, but I can pay my son a lot more because we're increasing prices. And by the way, if you went the subway recently, prices went higher and sizes shrunk down. You know, that foot long, it's missing an inch or two. Ladies can relate, right? The guy tells you he's packing a foot long and then uh, you see it in person and uh, let's just say that the night gets clouded with uh, awkwardness and a lot of apologies. It's called shrinkflation. I wasn't lying. I was packing a foot long, but this economy, you know, shrinkflation, it happens. Come on, man. Anyways, let's move on to earnings. Today, we had a lot of them. In the morning, we got BP, Pfizer, Martin Marietta, and Mosaic. After the bell, we got T-Mobile, Zillow, what a disaster that one was. Then Activision and Mondelez. A lot of stocks in my portfolio, long and short. So let's go over them, starting with BP. And there is some funny business here. I did not have the time to investigate everything, but there is something suspicious with BP. I own the stock. The stock was down big today, about 4% or so. And take a look at this. BP posts 3.3 billion third quarter profit beating estimates as oil prices surge. The British energy major posted an underlying replacement cost profit, a proxy for net profit, of $3.3 billion for the third quarter, above analysts' estimates of $3.1 billion. So far, so good. Rising commodity prices certainly helped, the CEO said. Once again, so far, so good. Here comes the however. However, the company reported a headline loss of $2.5 billion for the third quarter as a result of, listen to this, quote-unquote, significant adverse fair value accounting effects, which saw the company take a $6.1 billion hit, whatever that means. There's funny business here. I'm going to investigate, but the accounting doesn't look good at all. Now, when we look at the numbers, for example, the oil production numbers, they're down year over year. They're producing less for liquid, natural gas but they're charging more because the average realization, this is the average price, was around 65 and a half a barrel for liquid, and about 5.6 for natural gas. Now, you and I know that prices went a lot higher after that. Crude oil prices are trading around 80, 85 bucks. Natural gas prices are trading above six bucks. So the numbers are going to improve. But what's going on with the accounting here? We'll find out. The stock went down even though the company announced a billion dollar more in stock buybacks. Something is going on here. And I'm going to find it when I look in depth when I have the time. Next, we have Pfizer, one of the top criminal organizations in this country. And these are the kind of companies you want to be in, by the way. Crime pays, as you will see in a minute. I don't need to look at anything at all here. Not the income statement, not the balance sheet, not the cash flow. I just want to look at the revenues from the vaccines. Now, the revenues overall were up a stunning 134% year over year, and the net income was up a mind-blowing 555% hundred percent and of course you can attribute all of that to the vaccines because the revenues from vaccines shot up higher by about 850 percent year over year a stunning number all in all pfizer made in the third quarter alone over 14 and a half billion dollars from the vaccines there goes your taxpayer money you wonder why the media continues to beat the drum, the jab, the jab, the jab, get the jab, get the jab, get the jab, otherwise you're going to die. Everybody's going to die if you don't get the jab. Brought to you by Pfizer. I say they should cut Fauci in. Maybe 100 million, 200 million, 300 million. I mean, the guy's the best salesman in history. And of course, I had a trade for Pfizer a few days ago. Let's take a look. And here is a bonus chart for the ticker PFE Pfizer. I bought some Pfizer calls today, and the reason is the name is down over 20% top to bottom. And it is severely oversold. I'm betting for a rebound higher. This is the same play, by the way, that I have with OJ and Facebook. Therefore, I bought calls on Pfizer, anticipating an oversold bounce higher with a target of 44. And here is the update. The stock shot up higher. It exceeded my expectations, so I did close all of these calls took the profits and went home. Now, that doesn't mean that the stock can't go higher. It can. Matter of fact, it has the resistance at around 47 and a half. The problem is, what if this is peak vaccine revenue? Oh, wait a minute. We're going to have the boosters and the next variant and then another one and another one and another one and another one. It goes on and on and on. And now I regret closing my calls. Anyways, moving on to the next one. What do we have here? Martin Marietta, a stock that I own in my portfolio, and it did deliver. When you look at the revenues, they're up 18%. The expenses are up about 
22%. This is the problem here. Expenses are rising higher than the rate of revenues. And of course, the net income was down about 14%, but this is due to the increase of interest expenses, about 54% year over year. We also had an acquisition and that hit the company's bottom line. It is concerning that expenses are rising at a higher rate than revenues. You look the other way, we have the infrastructure bill they're going to pass something and Martin Marietta will be one of the biggest beneficiaries because we have inflation. Companies can charge more. We know that the biggest piggy bank spending on steroids is the government. The government will have contracts with the Martin Marietta and guess what? The company will jack the government, the taxpayer. If they charge 10% more for you and I, they will charge the government 50% more. And you know what? The government will pay because that's what they do. They put the blindfolds on, they open the checkbook and they write. Who cares? The taxpayer is going to pay. And then we have Mosiah, and I forgot to include this one in the list yesterday. The name reported earnings, and I don't see any problem here in the report. Yet the stock is down about 10%. Now, I had a trade on open trade for puts on Mosaic, and these puts printed today. The problem is that I also own the stock of Nutrin, the ticker NTR, which also reported earnings today, and unlike Mosaic, it met so called expectations from analysts. So, all in all, the puts on Mosaic made up for the losses in NTR. Now pay attention here. I see the drop in Mosaic, the ticker MOS, as an opportunity to buy because the results are pristine. I believe that the stock shot up higher and therefore the risk was to the downside if you miss on analysts' expectations, the stock will go down. Now don't jump right away buying the dip, give it a few days, perhaps by the end of the week, and then buy the dip because natural gas prices are exploding higher. And here are the results for Mosaic. And as you can see, the results are pristine. Net sales are up 43.5% year over year. Expenses are up 26% year over year. The operating earnings are up a stunning 715% year over year. And as you can see, the net earnings are up big. They were losing money last year. Now the company is swimming in cash. If natural gas prices continue to go higher, this name will also shoot up with natural gas prices. What is the relationship between natural gas and shit? Because this is what the company sells. Fertilizers. Well, they're all byproducts of gases, right? There is a lot of money in shit these days. Next, we have T-Mobile after the bill. Here are the numbers from the company. We're looking at the net customer additions. Last year, this number was on fire. People were canceling AT&T and Verizon, and they were switching to T-Mobile me included. Why? The service is good and the prices are cheaper. It is a great deal. The problem is now we are beyond the acquisition period. That cycle already peaked. As you can see, the numbers down quarter over quarter. and They're also down year over year. The growth in customers is slowing down. The challenge for the company right now, what do you do with all of these new customers that you have acquired and you have seduced away from Verizon AT&T? Well, the answer is you have to jack up prices higher. The problem is we switch to T-Mobile because of the value proposition. If you jack up prices higher, we're going to find you and then you know what's going to happen. And therefore, the company is not doing so hot. So the revenues a down quarter over quarter. They're barely up year over year. The net income is down quarter over quarter, and it is down big year over year. Matter of fact, it is down about 45% year over year. It is no surprise that the stock is trading down. And this is the challenge for T-Mobile. What do you do now? You have acquired all of these customers. You did the pricing war, underpricing AT&T and Verizon. Okay, what happens now? Maybe you announce uh, crypto, Shiba, NFT, or perhaps uh, T-Mobile buys 100,000 souffles because there is no way you can monetize the new acquisition, the new customers that you have acquired besides jacking up prices higher. Next, we have Zillow, an epic disaster, and perhaps a significant warning regarding the health of the housing market and the economy, by the way. This happens to be a name in my short portfolio, and it is the best performing name in that portfolio. I did not know that their home flipping business is a bust, but the thesis for shorting the stock was technical in nature, and we have rates rising higher. This is not good for a company like Zillow. I was intending to cover today before earnings, yet the stock was already down 10% before earnings. This is usually, not always, but usually, a warning signal that there is a massive bomb in the report, and the news was leaking already ahead of time. For example, before the stock even reported earnings, it was trading down by over 10%. And the reason is we got the news that about two-thirds of the homes that Zillow bought in the 
their flipping business, they're already underwater, meaning they're losing money. The geniuses that they are. They bought a bunch of houses in the hottest markets, the bubble territory markets like San Diego and Phoenix. They bought at the top. And now that the market is cooling, at least for now, they're going to lose money in these homes. We're talking about millions of homes. This is a serious problem. And it could bankrupt the company, by the way. This is a massive nuclear bomb in Zillow. And the bad news continued to drip. We had another one. Zillow reportedly needs to sell 7,000 houses after it bought too many. Again, the geniuses that they are. This is exactly what happened back in the 1990s, the dot-com bubble. There was a lot of excess. Companies like Yahoo, for example, AOL, their equity value shot up higher, out of whack. Now they have a lot of buying power to acquire smaller companies, to expand their business. What did they do? They acquired smaller businesses, smaller dot-com stocks and businesses at peak valuations, at mania valuations. They overpaid for these businesses. What do you know when the mania was over? All of these companies, a lot of them were actually a bust. For example, when Yahoo bought the garbage company for Mark Cuban, they paid top dollar for Mark and his company. Well, guess what? The company is garbage. They overpaid for it, and now it doesn't even exist. But Mark Cuban walked away with the money. This is exactly what's going on right now. Zillio, looking at their equity value, when it shot up higher, out of whack, they said, you know what? We're just going to borrow billions of dollars against our equity value and we're going to start buying homes and we're going to flip the homes. Wow, what a genius idea. What do you know? The stock crashed, the housing market cooled, and now they're holding a bag, a massive bag worth billions of dollars. They got caught with their pants down. And after the release of the report, there was no relief at all because the stock continued to crash. Of course, Zillow reported revenues. The revenues are growing higher year over year no problem here whatsoever but they're doing a cute trick here by not including their expenses but the numbers don't lie anyways you look at the net income they're losing over 300 million dollars this quarter alone a massive loss and they stand to lose even more in upcoming quarters stay away toxic garbage toxic waste i was debating whether i should close my short and now i have the answer just let it ride this epic disaster could take the stock down to zero. Bankruptcy. The ticker Z for zero. But this is not a joking matter, folks. This is an epic disaster and a dire warning from Zillow about the housing market and the economy. Take a look at this. Zillow to stop flipping homes for good. No more. We're done. As it stands to lose more than $550 million. Perhaps this is the most important part. We'll lay off a quarter of staff. Here comes the slowdown of the housing market and unemployment. Oh boy, Jerome Powell f***ed up big time. Big time. He's about to tighten right now. He's forced to tighten while the economy is slowing down. Ay, ay, ay. The nightmare scenario. And then we have Activision, aka the frat house. A disgusting company. I am very disappointed, by the way, because I pitched the stock for you before as the best name in video game stocks. And now... They're not even delivering in numbers. Forget about the culture problems. They're not even delivering numbers. The headline reads, Activision Blizzard stock drops more than 10% following light outlook game delays. The revenues were up 6% year over year. On the other hand, expenses were also up 6% year over year. All in all, the net income was down 6% year over year. Forget about it. They got a lot of problems here. Take your money and move on. And then we have Mondelez, another stock that I own in my portfolio. You, this is a giant consumer staple and they have a lot of pricing power. Listen to this. When it comes to input cost inflation, it is worldwide, but most pronounced in the U.S. When it comes to supply chain volatility, it is more notable in the U.S. and the U.K. When it comes to COVID-related disruptions, they bring out the factory closures in Vietnam. Now, when we look at the different segments of the business, for example, biscuits, they're still growing, but be it at a slower pace. The best performing segment is chocolate, growing year over year and quarter over quarter. And then we have the most concerning segment of the business the gum and candy. This has been an underperforming segment for the last few quarters, going all the way back to last year. The good news is that the revenue growth in the gum and candy segment of Mondelez is now growing back, and it is up year over year and quarter over quarter. We will look at the different regions for the business. For the last few quarters, the concern was Latin America. Well, guess what? The revenue growth from Latin America is bouncing back, up 23% year over year. For Asia, Middle East, and Africa, sales are up 10 
7.8% a year over year, where Europe sales were up 7.4% a year over year. For North America, this is the source of concern right now. Sales in North America were up only 1.4% a year over year. Now, here's the take. Inflation is hurting the business as you'll hear from the CEO in a minute. But this is a consumer staple giant with pricing power. Are they going to exercise their pricing power? Well, here's the answer. Margins were down a bit it, in line with expectations. What are you seeing and experiencing with regard to supply chain costs, issues, any shortages, anything like that? Oh, yes. We, I mean, you must have uh, had a, an earful in the, with the different earnings, but uh, it's quite, uh, quite extraordinary what's going on, and uh, you've he heard it everywhere. What we are seeing, particularly related to us, is uh, we see the commodity prices uh, higher than you would expect. Uh, we see particularly oils uh, also, packaging is up, and then transportation. Not only are the costs up, sometimes 70, 80 percent in the U.S., uh, but there is a shortage of drivers and trucks, so it's very difficult to um, keep our clients uh, well stocked. Um, uh, our own shelf availability is nowhere near where we would like it to be. So that's having a, a big effect uh, on us. Uh, the reaction to that, of course, is trying to limit the range of products that you sell so that at least that limited range, you can keep it in stock. Um, we're also trying to uh, offset some of those costs through pricing, uh, revenue growth management, uh, reduction of promotions uh, to absorb those extra costs. And then overall, we are uh, trying to find more long-term uh, solutions for some of those transportation issues, like starting our own uh, shipping routes and uh, on, I mean, trucking routes in the U.S. Uh, the, the problems are worse in the U.S. than in the rest of the world, but you can, I can feel it uh, almost everywhere around the world, I would say. That, that's so interesting that it, it's most pronounced here. I mean, uh, is it going to be also most prolonged here? And, and to what level of, uh, of price increase might it, might it lead to? Well, what we certainly are seeing is that the level of uh, growth uh, of, uh, in our input costs, which was significant in 2021, not going to slow down in 2022. It's, it's higher, I would say. Not a lot, but it's higher. So we're looking at input cost inflation of about 6% for next year. Um, as a consequence, you are going to see um, uh, price increases. Um, we, at the moment, are looking at uh, starting off 2022 with about a 7% price increase in the U.S. And then we'll have to see what happens to those different costs uh, during the year if another price increase would be needed. So now we have another one. Mondelez also jacking prices higher by the tune of 7% next year. Year over year, prices will go higher by 7%. So when the delusional maniacs say inflation is transitory, what are you talking about here? And for now, the zombified consumer remains receptive. They say, you know what? Jacking prices higher, no problem. We're going to pay more. Look at my crypto gains. Look at my meme stock gains. We got the cash. We can afford it. The problem is you can afford it for now. What happens when your crypto gains and your stock gains go down? What happens with your employer? Say Zillow gambles with the money. They lose and they have to fire your ass. And now your source of income is gone. Hoof. And you are left holding the bag. Not only that, your source of income is gone. You better hope that your crypto gains and your stock gains will be intact. Because if you lose that too, now you have to face this inflation with nothing. You got no purchasing power and prices around you still going higher and higher and higher. Do you even have a plan or not? Lastly, what about Nintendo? This is a Japanese company, so we're not going to cover the details, but it is yet another warning signal. That the mass shortages that we're facing right now, specifically in chips, will not be alleviated anytime soon. Matter of fact, Nintendo is now saying we're going to reduce our production of the Switch console by 20%. So if you're going to buy one for Christmas, you better get it now. Otherwise, your kids are going to look under the tree and there is nothing in there. And you're going to have to spend your Christmas apologizing to your kids. The good news is you can always blame it on Santa. Santa did not show up. It's his fault, not mine. Actually, you should not blame Santa because he's a good guy, right? Just tell your kids that Santa caught COVID. Or better yet, how about you blame it on somebody else? How about you blame it on the Grinch, a.k.a. Jerome Powell, the man who stole Christmas? 
Now let's move on to the last segment of the commentary, which is the fake news of Hertz buying 100,000 Teslas, or maybe 150,000 Teslas, or maybe 200,000 Teslas, maybe half a million, maybe a million. Let's make it a trillion souffles. And I told you right away, this is a fake news story. It is not believable. Right away, the moment the news was out. I told you, it is fake news. Neither Tesla can deliver that number for one customer. Or Hertz, a company that just emerged from bankruptcy. They cannot afford to buy 100,000 Teslas. Oh, by the way, full option, the full package. Are we really that stupid? Well, some of you are. Sometimes I feel that I have to walk you. I have to hold your hand and walk you in this jungle. Not just the market, but life in general. Because some of you got the book smart, but not the street smart. Me, I grew up in a slum overseas. I can spot a scam from 6,000 miles away and this one is one of those scams needless to say of course the stock of tesla shot up higher the wealth of elon musk also shot up higher creating about a hundred billion dollars in net worth and i told you right away reverend elon is not gonna mind you give him a free hundred billion he'll take it and a few days later he'll tell you you know what forget about the deal it's not gonna happen of course the stock will go a little bit down but it's not gonna erase all the gains and therefore reverend elon the scammer that he is gets to keep some of the gains but you who's yoloing the stock and having the fomo you get to buy call options with the expiration date of this friday the 2000 call options huh and then you end up holding the bag it's the same scam all over again lather rinse repeat reverend elon overnight of course in a twitter response to somebody bragging about his tesla souffle gains reverend elon says you're welcome for the gains if any of this based on hurts i'd like to emphasize that no contract has been signed yet listen to this tesla has far more demand than production exactly as i told you therefore we will only sell cars to hertz for the same margin as to consumers hertz deal has zero zero effect on our economics meaning it's fake news but i'm gonna play with it because it made me richer elon musk says hertz has not signed a contract with tesla yet news of the 100,000 Teslas or 150,000 or 200 or 300,000 Teslas. The order, regardless, pumped up Tesla shares and made Elon Musk the first person in history to exceed over $300 billion in net worth. This is the power of stupidity, the power of the stampede. And of course, the scumbags over at Hertz, they say Tesla already started delivering cars. Even though Musk says there is no signed deal yet. What does that mean? The scumbags over at Hertz, they're lying. They're making shit up. Why? Because they want to pump the IPO. That's all there is. And you know what they're going to say? Yeah, we ordered 100,000 Teslas in the metaverse. You know, as an NFT, we did not lie. These sleazy scumbags who are leading Hertz right now. And their sinister intentions are to pump and dump in the IPO, to steal money from mom and pops, seduce them, to buy the IPO because Hertz has 100,000 Teslas. You buy the IPO, they dump right away, it's a pump and dump scheme. Where is the SEC by the way? You know that the SEC is still in a coma and it will never wake up. Oh and by the way, we also have bad news for the souffle. Tesla's forced to recall about 12,000 souffles. Why? Because of software glitch, the FSD glitch. And by glitch, we mean the car breaks and it crashes and it kills somebody else. Tesla has no integrity at all. They're using the customers as guinea pigs to collect data and improve their software endangering not just their customers and their drivers but all of us when i'm driving on the highway and suddenly a souffle right in front of me slams on the brake for no good reason and i get hit what happens then why is tesla allowed to use their customers as guinea pigs and endanger all of us by experimenting on american roads here it is i say where is the sec we now know that we have tesla insiders who dumped hundreds of millions of dollars of stock as shares pumped higher based on the fake news from Hertz. What happens now? Where is the SEC? Where is Gensler? For all you know, Gensler is also yellowing stocks and buying call options. Anyhow, a Tesla board member exercised 370,000 options at about 50 bucks a piece on Wednesday. SEC filing said, Mr. Gensler, you might want to wake up. 
the filing is already at the SEC. Era Enterprises, whatever that is, then unloaded 203,429 shares at more than a thousand bucks apiece. Massive profit. Another departing member announced the sale of more than 600, 600 million in stock. Once again, where is the SEC? This has to be investigated, at least. I'm not accusing anybody of wrongdoing, but this has to be investigated. And this is the gentleman in question, Era, whatever his name is. I'm not saying he is cheating or did something wrong, but the SEC has to look into it. Anyhow, folks, in the interest of time, because this is already too late, we're going to stick to charts and the outlook. So let's start with the 30 minutes chart for the SPY. What's going on here? We have the breakout in the wedge and it happened to the upside. And now the chart is just consolidating in a bull flag pattern, waiting for another pop higher. The support for now remains at 454. Now, when we switch to a daily chart for the continuous contract on the SPY, here's the problem. The chart is begging for a pullback. It is overextended from the RSI, from the MACD, and for now, the move is vertical. We're not going to have consolidation. We're not going to have a pullback. We're not going to have a small down day. When this thing reverses, it's going to be a flush down. Because here's a little secret for you. Why do you think that every year, almost every year, not always, but almost, we have a so-called Santa Ratty? It happens because us money managers have to close the year at a good note. Otherwise, we don't make our bonuses, our large sums of payments if the market goes down. And therefore, we encourage our clients to invest more, to buy more. Why are you waiting in the sidelines? The seasonality is good. The dip is to buy. Historically speaking, the fourth quarter is good. We have a Santa Ratty, yada, yada, yada. And therefore, you're seeing the flows. It started with the algos buying the dip and the retail stampeding and also buying ETFs and other stocks. Then you have the money managers encouraging mom and pops to buy the market. And therefore, we have this excessive, impulsive, vertical move higher. When you have an excessive, impulsive move higher like this, any bad news, and we're about to have some, by the way, any bad news will flush the chart down. We're not going to have a pullback. We're not even going to have a consolidation at this point. We're going to have a flush down. What will be the catalyst? You're about to find out. So we have a conflict here. The 30 minutes chart is bullish. We have a bull flag pattern indicating another pop to come. The daily chart says, be careful here. The reversal will happen any minute now. We're just looking for a catalyst. We're just looking for a spark. Moving on to the queues, what's going on here? Similar story. We have the inflows. They're buying ETFs. They're buying big cap technology names. It doesn't matter. The chart is consolidating right now in a bull flag pattern. A watch out now that I'm placing the bull flag. Watch out how the chart's going to crash tomorrow. And by the way, the support remains. This is the legit support, not the soft supports. We have plenty of those. But the legit support remains at 372. What does that mean? If this chart reverses, and it will reverse, we will have a flush down all the way to 372. We will look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Again, the la la land, the ridiculous nature, stampeding, buying the dip, and now we have overdone it. The technicals are extended. Any spark, any little spark will produce a flush down candle. It could happen as soon as tomorrow, by the way. And there is another dynamic. Every time we have a meme mania with GameStop, AMC, Bed Bath & Beyond, surging higher, the equities market, the human being market, meaning the SPY, the NASDAQ, underperforms. So watch out for that. I'm not picking any support numbers here. Let's wait for the reversal to happen, and then we will find where the support is. Because a flush down candle will not respect support levels. Moving on to the IWM. What's going on here? 30 minutes chart. It went down for a little bit in the morning, retesting the support at 233. And this took a little bit of the overextension in the RSI and MACD indicators. And therefore, this is a healthy development for the IWM. We also have a bull flag pattern indicating that the next move will be higher. Now, when we look at the rut, the big Russell 2000 from a weekly perspective, the chart has been consolidating since the beginning of the year. Nothing happened. This is a process of gathering of energy. The energy will be produced one way or the other, up or down. For now, it appears to be on the way higher. And if it happens, then the Russell 2000 will explode higher. Now, does it make sense at this time of the cycle for the IWM to pop higher? It doesn't 
but the technicals say that we're about to have a massive move higher in the IWM, the Russell 2000, if the prior highs are beaten. If you look at the MACD indicator, it is finally crossing to positive territory. Yet another supporting indicator that the break out of the consolidation range will happen to the upside. And it has been a pattern for at least the last few years that the IWM small caps outperformed the SPY, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ in the fourth quarter. Moving on to the Dixie, what's going on here in tricky Dixie land? It appears that the Dixie is about to pop higher. Here comes the conflicting information. Would the market like it if the Dixie pops higher? Not really. So which one is telling the truth here? Is it the Dixie? Is it the SPY? Is it the NASDAQ? Is it the VIX? which we will cover in a little bit, we have a lot of conflicting information here. Everybody's waiting for what Fed Chairman is about to say. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, that is. What is he going to say tomorrow? We know tapering. That's already priced in $15 billion. But if he starts speaking in a hawkish tone about inflation getting out of whack, and perhaps at some point he might be more aggressive in tapering or maybe jacking interest rates higher sooner, than expectations, then we're going to have a problem and the dollar could explode higher. What about gold? What's going on here? Not looking good. The MACD indicator is weakening and it's about to cross to negative territory. If that happens, it is just a matter of time before gold flushes down all the way to 1,685, perhaps 1,680 within that zone. And for that to happen, the dollar has to pop first. Moving on to yields for the 10 year yield. What's going on here? It's going to be a massive day for this chart. Either it's going to pop higher significantly or it's going to flush down. For now, the indicators that we have, the hour side MACD indicators, are all in negative divergence, suggesting that the move will be to the downside. The 10 year will flush down. Does it make sense? Of course not. But if the market reads Powell's statement as bearish regarding the growth of the economy, then you will see the short end of the yield curve exploding higher, the two year while the long end of the curve collapsing. However, if there is any indication that Powell will be more hawkish than expectations, or perhaps he will raise interest rates higher sooner than expectations, he's not going to do it tomorrow, of course, but he will hint to it. It's a game of expectations. It is a game of management of expectations. If he screws up, then you will see the 10-year yield exploding higher. And the confirmation for the weakness in this chart will be closing the week below 1.5%. Moving on to the TLT weekly chart, what's going on here? It is looking good, but yet again, we have a reversal in the negative divergence in the RSI, but not the MACD indicator from a weekly perspective. Furthermore, the chart is not trading above 149. If it closes the week above 149, then in turn, the chart of the 10-year yield will close below 1.5%. And then we will have a confirmation that the TLT will go higher. But most importantly, we have the top for the year in the 10-year Treasury yield. And by the way, this will not be a good outlook for the market at all. Because when the long end of the yield curve goes down, while the short end of the yield curve surges higher, this is called flattening of the yield curve. And soon enough, the yield curve inverts, meaning that the shorter end pays more than the longer end. And this is always always an indicator of an upcoming recession so we'll see what happens here critically important day tomorrow now if you ask me personally what do i think i personally maintain the outlook that yields will pop higher and the tlt will go down because the pace of economic growth is still intact inflation is growing higher at some point inflation will cripple the economy if not mitigated by action in the fed's policy but for now we will look at the indicators for example the chicago pmi the forward guidance for the chicago pmi says the expectations are for more growth and more inflation meaning the longer end of the yield curve should continue to move higher moving on to the vix four hours chart what's going on here once again we have a reliable indicator here in the vix four hours chart. By looking at the MACD indicator, the moment we have a crossing producing red impressions on the histogram, you know the VIX will dive down and as a result, the SPY will take a leg higher. This is exactly what happened for now. So again, so far, the SPY, the NASDAQ, the IWM 30 minutes chart, the intraday charts, all indicating that the market will blast higher. The VIX is also indicating that the market will continue to move higher. The problem is the daily charts for the market are not indicating so. You combine that with the chart of the dollar index and the daily chart of the VIX 
which is showing a bull flag pattern. And then we have the conflict between the intraday charts and the daily charts. The intraday charts suggesting the market will blast higher. The daily charts are saying, watch out, we're nearing a top here. We're getting extremely close. And here is a daily chart for Apple. What's going on here? The chart continues to struggle at the level of resistance around 150. It peaked above that level in the morning, but the chart closed at the lows of the day. Not a good sign here. Perhaps a sign that Apple will go down to the support of 145. I guess the enthusiasm about the eye cloth is gone now. It was transitory. Moving on to Tesla, the souffle daily chart. What's going on here? Nothing is going on. There's nothing to read at all. This is all about options and the sentiment in the market. It's all about the psychology. The technicals are saying the RSI is overextended and it is curling down. What does that mean? A pullback will happen. It is already happening. The psychology says Tesla options are getting expensive. You have Avis, the ticker car. You have Bed and Bath and Beyond, or Bed Bath and Beyond. You have GameStop, you have AMC, you have Koss, and other meme stocks. If they're about to heat up right now, then forget about Tesla. The money will rotate out of Tesla into these meme stocks. And therefore, the risk versus reward is the move is over. The pump is over. Moving on to BTC. Tulips. What's going on here in tulip land? The daily chart is looking pretty good, at least for now. The negative divergence on the RSI is about to be reversed. So is the MACD indicator. This is exactly what we say when we have extended technicals from the RSI and MACD. And then the chart consolidates. It doesn't flush down. We don't see the pump and dump scheme. The chart consolidates. It takes the overextended, overbought conditions from the RSI and MACD indicators out, and then it moves higher. The other hand of the chart corrects the overextension, the RSI and MACD indicators via flush down. The likelihood becomes you have a top at least for a few weeks. Now, when we zoom into a 30 minutes chart, last night we had the reverse head and shoulder formation, and it produced a pop higher in BTC. Now it appears, at least for now, this chart was taken hours ago. It appears that we have a head and shoulder formation. I don't know what the chart looks like for now, but yet here it is once again the conflict between the intraday charts and the daily chart. Moving on to AMC, what's going on here? The energy is back in AMC. We had the saucer bottom. The resistance of 36.5 was broken. And now after hours, AMC is popping higher. If we see the resumption of the mania in meme stocks, in all likelihood, this stock will pop higher. It might face resistance around 42.5, but remember this, the implied volatility in AMC remains at historic lows. So there is a lot of room for a squeeze to happen. Lastly, what about the chart for the ticker PROG? I tweeted a few days ago that I believe that the pop in this name is coming to an end. And I bought some put options on the name. The name went down about 36% top to bottom. I did close these puts, even though the stock is trading down after hours. Yet if the meme stock mania is about to make a comeback, then this stock will also be YOLO'd. It will go higher and higher and higher. We have what it appears to be, at least for now, a reversal candle. And therefore, I closed my put options. Will it go higher? Who knows? But if we have the meme stocks rising higher together, then I'm assuming this is one of those meme names. Moving on to the conclusion of this video, starting with the earnings calendar, what do we have tomorrow? In the morning, we have CVS Pharmacy, and watch out for this name. They're buying calls like crazy. And then we have Emerson, and after the bell, we have Wynn Resorts, Qualcomm, Etsy, Discovery, Marriott, and Ruco. What do we have on the economic calendar? We have a lot of activities here. We're going to have an action-packed day tomorrow. Buckle up your seatbelts, folks. Grab the popcorn, because we have the ADP report. This is the private payrolls. Then we have the services PMI, the ISM services index. We also have the big dog, the statement, and the press conference from Jerome Powell. Unbelievable day. And the questions will be wide. Are you going to taper? How much? Are you going to be aggressive? Is inflation transitory or not? What about raising interest rates? What about your tenure, Mr. Powell? Biden did not announce a nominee, at least for now. We're running out of time. Historically speaking, this is the time for the administration to announce 
who is going to lead the Fed. We have yet to have an announcement, and so far the market is hiking expectations of a more aggressive taper and a sooner interest rate hike. Powell is against all odds here. An imminent Fed taper seems like a done deal, with focus shifting to when and how quickly the Fed will raise interest rates. Economists currently see rates rising to 1.75% by the end of 2024. Make that 2022, a quarter point more than expected in September. At this point, the market is expecting a sooner hike and a more aggressive hike. This is not good news for Powell. On top of that, perhaps Powell will be forced to be more hawkish while the economy is slowing, and this is the nightmare scenario. You want to taper, you want to tighten, and raise interest rates when the economy is doing fine, not when the economy is contracting, but he has no choice but to do so. And the reason is inflation is surging out of whack. You know what we need tomorrow in the conference? We need Sam Jackson to be one of the reporters asking questions. And every time Powell says transitory, Sam Jackson replies, Say transitory one more time, mother Now, speaking of Sam Jackson, even Tarantino is now juicing the NFT mania by selling some scenes from Pulp Fiction. Well, I got the DVD. I got it for free. I don't need to pay for the NFT. But before my ADHD goes haywire, let's conclude this video by visiting the immediate wall of worry. Not the real wall of worry that has China and Taiwan, etc, etc. The immediate wall of worry, meaning tomorrow. We have the elections in Virginia. And so far, I'm looking at the TV right now. They're not calling it, but I'm calling it. The Republican already won Virginia, and it appears that the Republicans are winning New Jersey. New Jersey has a Republican now. What have you done, Joe? What have you done? And this outcome, of course, will impact the next item in the wall of worry, the so-called bill, the spending bill, which we're waiting for. They told us we're going to have a vote today. I hear crickets, nothing. And this outcome, if the Republican indeed wins in Virginia and New Jersey, it will embolden Senator Manchin and his allies to be more aggressive and more stubborn. You gotta cut more, cut more spending, no more taxes, yada, yada, yada. Now, I told you the market is bipolar. On one hand, it wants the spending. The market wants the coke, the spending on steroids. On the other hand, the market doesn't want corporate taxes to go higher. The market is worried that more spending will produce more inflation, and more inflation will elicit a reaction from the Fed by tightening the monetary policy more aggressively, which leads us to the third item on the wall of worry, which is the future of Jerome Powell. The market wants Jerome Powell. Powell is the best thing that ever happened to the stock market. Removing Powell will produce a market crash. The problem is, if this outcome stands in Virginia, in New Jersey, a Republican win, and the defeat for the Democrats and Biden, you will find out that part of the reason is inflation. Voters are frustrated by the prices they're paying in gas, grocery stores, bills, the supply chain woes, not receiving gifts this Christmas, this holiday season. They're gonna blame the Biden administration for it. Biden, in turn, will have to blame Jerome Powell and say, you know what, you screwed me. This inflation is your fault and I'm eating the blame for it. He removes Powell, the market crashes right away because the market doesn't care about the economy. The market cares about the coke and the king of coke is Jerome Powell. He's the Pablo Escobar monetary coke. And this is the dilemma for now. Will Biden remove Powell and say, you know what, this is the guy to blame for inflation. We got him out. He's done. We're going to have somebody else. Problem solved. Or would he make even a bigger mess here with inflation sticking, the supply chain woes sticking. And on top of that, the market crashes because Powell is gone. These are the things we're watching carefully in the immediate term, of course. Anyhow, folks, I'm beat up here, beyond beat up. This is all I got for you for now, but I will talk to you again tomorrow. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.